all in yet though. Yeah, we've got 56 people, 57. Welcome everyone. 71 people are in the waiting room. Welcome, welcome. This is exciting. I think this may be the best program we've done so far. I just have this feeling it's about to happen. We have an all-star class, a, a class of lit cast of ladies here that are all bringing like complete fire and passion to this conversation. This is going to be amazing. We got 137. Welcome, welcome. Someone asked, can a friend who hasn't registered still get in? I'm pretty sure, just share the link. I have no issues with that. It's a free program, so share away. We're also recording this as well. Welcome everyone. So I give everybody about three minutes to get into the Zoom before I kick things off. This is gonna be a very exciting program tonight and I cannot wait. This is so wonderful having you all on here. I'm truly, my heart is so full right now. This is fantastic. Welcome everyone. Let's see what time it is here. 702, I'm gonna give it to 703. Yes, we'll be sharing the recording afterwards. Also, just so everyone knows, the chat, um, it should be open, I'm pretty sure. Yes, it is. And on the top of the chat, there's a link to the video that we're gonna be showing during a portion of the program tonight. So if for some reason, when I show the video, it's lagging on your end, you can literally just click the YouTube link and watch it on your own. So that's just a backup in case there's some kind of issue on your end with the video part of it. Welcome everyone. This is so exciting. I will repost the link right here. Do not watch that until we start the program in that particular part of the program. All right, it is 7.03. All right, welcome everyone um, to this wonderful program tonight at Stratford Hall. My name is Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz. I'm the Director of Collections and Visitor Engagement at Stratford Hall Plantation. And I am here tonight with my esteemed and completely amazing colleagues and friends. We have Ramin, Nicole, Tanya, and Chaney. I know these ladies from all different walks of my life and they bring complete dedication to the stories and the recipes of their ancestors. And I am honored and delighted to have all four of you powerful women here tonight to talk about the history and legacy of chocolate, of soul food, of enslaved laborers in the colonies, and the ways in which their history and legacy is seen in contemporary kitchens. So tonight's program is brought to you by Marge Wrigley through the Forrest E. Marge Jr. Chocolate History Grant. And we are honored at Stratford to have been a recipient two years in a row to provide these kinds of chocolate programming to be able to talk about honest Honestly and holistically, full transparency about the history of the transatlantic slave trade, the participation of the folks that were growing the chocolate, what the chocolate did sort of, you know, to the Atlantic world, the ways in which it was used, both, his, both historically and contemporarily. And we are here here tonight to talk specifically about the intersections of, of slavery, chocolate, and American cuisine with a particular thread of looking at it through the eyes of enslaved women and their descendants. And so again, it is an honor to have the four of you on tonight. And so the way tonight's program is going to work is I will introduce very quickly, we have um, Tanya Holland, who is the chef and owner of Brown Sugar Kitchen, as well as a celebrity chef with her TV show on OWN and a Top Chef contestant and a wonderful human being. We also have Chaney McKnight, who is the CEO of Not Your Mama's History. And she is a absolute dedicated historian who's beating down the sidewalks, making sure everyone knows this history. We have Nicole Moore as well, <clears throat> excuse me, who is a public historian and an interpreter who has also dedicated her life to telling these stories. And we have, of course, um, Ramin Garench. Oh my goodness, I just totally butchered your name. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We have Ramin Ganeshram, is that correct? I was making sure, I just totally stumbled. Anyways, we have you, you are a um, historian of African diaspora food, the author of 
a wonderful book about Chef Hercules called The General's Cook, as well as the executive director of the museum in Connecticut. So we have these phenomenal women here tonight. We are going to start off this program by having Ramin give a wonderful and very sort of detailed backdrop of the history of the Atlantic world and where chocolate falls into that narrative. And then we are going to play a short video of Nicole and Shaney doing a really beautifully done, very emotional demonstration of two different chocolate dishes and then we're going to open it up with a conversation where I will lead off some questions for Tanya how she uses chocolate how she is, has used the recipes and the stories of her ancestors in her professional career as well as the ways in which everyone on this call has used those stories to elevate and amplify the history of African Americans in this nation. So on that note, I'm gonna ask my wonderful panelists to go ahead and click off and I'm gonna hand over the microphone to my esteemed colleague, Ramin. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that amazing introduction. And I'm so grateful to, to be here. I'm gonna share my screen. Here we are. Hopefully you all see this. Great. So uh, this is a presentation. I just want to give you all a really quick overview, sort of a miniature deep dive into chocolate in the colonial world and as part of the Atlantic trade. The picture you see there is, of course, taken in the Stratford Hall kitchens. And what you see there is called an atate or a chocolate grinding stone. You're going to see it in use later. So first of all, just a little bit of an overview. Uh, many of you probably already know this, but of course, chocolate comes from Mesoamerica, Central America. It was first encountered by European colonizers, the Spaniards in Mexico, amongst the Aztec and Mayan people. But in fact, um, drinking what was then a cold spice drink of ground cocoa beans, uh, you know, had predated uh, those that the Spanish um, colonizers had first encountered probably by 2000 years. It's been drunk in this area of the world um, for three to 4,000 years. And in fact, on the left, you see these bowls, those were found in Utah um, and uh, in, in uh, archeological sites and they have remnants of chocolate. So clearly the trade of chocolate from Central America up through North America is many thousands of years old. Little interesting fact about cocoa, cacao, it only grows within 23 degrees on either side of the equator, all the way around the globe. And this region is now called the cocoa belt. So just a little bit of an overview of what, what is cocoa really like? I think a lot of folks who haven't experienced it firsthand um, don't really know what it's like. So when we say cocoa or cacao, we mean the tree and the fruit. You see a diagram. It's an 18th century diagram of cacao. Um, I can tell you from the shape of those beans that those are criollo beans, uh, one of the native Central American beans, the other being forastero or pods rather. The beans are actually the seeds of the fruit. You see them inside in that cross section. The three major cultivars are criollo and forastero, which come from Central America, and Trinitario, which was actually hybridized on the island of Trinidad, where my ancestors are from, um, in the 17th, it's 18th century, 1750s, after uh, a disease wiped out the Criollo plant, which was very, very delicate. Today, Trinitario chocolate is considered the world's only 100% fine flavor cocoa, meaning it is used to flavor other lesser quality of cocoa grown elsewhere in the world. Chocolate, other than cocoa, is actually what we call that final product. The final product that happens from grinding cocoa beans and molding it into a bar or a disc or what's called a cake, uh, you know, back in the 18th century, 17th, 18th, and early 19th century. What you see on the left actually are not rocks. Those are pure 100% cocoa beans ground together. Uh, with different flavorings in the Caribbean. This, I believe, comes from Grenada. Uh, it's a practice still done today. It was a practice done in the 18th century and the period of colonization. I mean, real quick, mm -hmm. can you do the um, play from start so the slides are bigger? Sure. Some of the guests are having a hard time seeing the, the pictures. Let's see. Let's hit play from start, top left. I'm not getting that. Hold on a second. Something just happened there. No worries. 
Is that there you go. Bit? Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Remy. You're welcome. Okay. So chocolate, as I said, is the final product, uh, whether it's a cocoa ball or a cocoa stick or this beautiful um, chocolate that we have today. And that's actually a different process. But let me talk about the process, very simplified of taking cacao, the fruit, and turning it into chocolate. At the bottom left, you're gonna see a beautiful picture of actually a split cocoa pod. And you can see the white uh, is covering, that's a pulp that covers the seeds of the beans. I'll tell you that when I was a child going to Trinidad with my father every year in the summers, we would take the seeds out of the cocoa pod and suck off that pulp it's sweet tart. And then we just spit the seeds out and everywhere they fell, these precious cocoa trees would grow, but we didn't know any better. We just thought, you know, it was a tasty fruit. So here's how you process cocoa, cacao into chocolate. It has to be harvested by hand. It was true uh, in the beginning of its um, entry into the Atlantic trade in the 16th century. Actually, it's true today. It has to be done by hand. Then you basically ferment these beans. You lay them out on these big um, trays or sheds. There's an example of a cocoa drying house or shed uh, in the Caribbean. And that is so that pulp I, talk about, I talked about can rot away. And then eventually it dries. Those beans are then, you know, uh, brown little beans. And then you roast them. Um, once they're roasted, you crack the shells off and you, you break it up in a pestle into nibs. That's ground up and things are added to it. It could be cocoa butter in the present day, not in the 18th century, sugar or spices, and then it's molded into the shape that you want it to be. So it is a fairly laborious process. Um, during the period of colonization, we're talking about a process that from beginning to end was generally managed by enslaved people, certainly in the Caribbean, and for the most part, or for a large part here in the North American colonies. So sugar being a major aspect of the Atlantic trade and um, the, the um, especially between the Caribbean and North America was also the reason why chocolate or cacao became a major product or um, a commodity in the Atlantic trade. And the reason is that when the Spanish first tasted that chocolate drink I mentioned of the Aztecs and the Maya, they didn't like it. It was bitter and it was cold. So what they did was they heated it up and they added the sugar that they had already brought to the Americas, Columbus brought um, sugar to Hispaniola uh, for the purpose of trying to grow it on this side of the world. They added prodigious amounts to it, to this drink, heated it up, and suddenly it was the best thing ever. And that required growing it in mass quantity. And growing it in a mass quantity required massive amounts of labor, in other words, enslaved labor to grow this cacao along with the sugar. So these two things, highly intertwined. So every cup of chocolate or hot chocolate, uh, cocoa tea, as it's called in the Caribbean, actually tells the story of the Atlantic trade. It tells the story of sugar. It, it tells the story of cacao, these major engines um, of the trade, but also spices because those early um, drinks essentially were very much um, spiced. They still are in the Caribbean. We can talk about that later. Um, and so you're talking about every aspect, every piece of that commodity trade um, is largely represented in every cup of hot cocoa as it was drunk in, in that period of time. So I, I wanted to include this for you all because I think it's just a really interesting um, aspect of cacao, at least in, in the Caribbean. A culture has arisen around this idea, um, around this culture of enslaved people, later indentured people growing cocoa growing sugar. What you see on the right is something, and we talk about women being involved in this, um, you know, aspect of chocolate and history and, and you know, so cultural recognition. What you see on the right is called dancing the cocoa. So cocoa beans are actually polished before they're roasted. And in uh, the period of enslavement and really pretty much well into the 20th century, this was done by women who literally danced upon these beans so that they would be polished under their feet. It's sort of akin to pressing wine grapes, you know, stepping in a, in a wine vat. Songs and special dances and lore and legend and tradition have arisen around dancing the cocoa in the Caribbean. Another aspect of it that you see to the left, what you see there is actually a tradition in Trinidad called parang or parandar, which is a Christmas tradition of singing carols in Spanish. It was brought to the island by um, cocoa laborers from Venezuela who were brought from Venezuela in the 18th century to Trinidad specifically because of their knowledge, harvesting, 
and drying and uh, fermenting cocoa beans and that remains a tradition today. So how did this cocoa get north, right? Get up here to, to the Northern colonies? Um, so first of all, let me say to you that, as I said, as part of the Atlantic trade, the ships that were constantly coming up here with molasses, with rum, um, with enslaved people, you know, part of this was also carrying cocoa beans. Here's the interesting thing about it. Because the North, North America was so much closer to the Caribbean, uh, cocoa chocolate had a much larger audience than in Europe. In Europe, it was very precious. It was very expensive. It took um, a long time to get there. The crop could have been lost uh, on the way to um, across the Atlantic. It's a very delicate uh, sort of bean. It rots easily. And so over in the United States, or what became the United States, you're talking about pretty much everybody had some kind of access to chocolate. Not every day, not in great quantity, but it would be more likely for your average American to have tried it at some point in their life um, than your average European. So it was more democratically consumed. The problem was that this greater demand meant that there was a greater demand for the beans themselves. So a requirement of more production in the Caribbean plantations. And so largely mills, mostly actually in New England and Boston, um, in Providence, Rhode Island, in Newport, even New Haven, Connecticut, were demanding thousands and thousands of pounds of cocoa beans uh, per year to mill and then press into cakes that were actually sent to the South, to Virginia, to Maryland, and so on. So by the 18th century, really by the late 17th century in the North American colonies, chocolate was a, what's called a daily necessity. You could see some quotes there um, from various sources, Massachusetts Bay and in Virginia, as well as an ad um, for a chocolate miller. Um, essentially, pretty much, it was considered the kind of ration that was um, really required. We have accounts of um, quartermasters during the, the Revolutionary War really saying, you know, writing, um, you know, to their suppliers saying, writing to Congress saying that injured men really required chocolate to get better. It would make them feel better if they could have a ration of cocoa beans. So a culture was built around this idea of chocolate consumption. Um, so this was true both in the house, if you were a wealthy individual and could afford to consume it more often, as well as in coffee houses. You know, it was, it was consumed as much as coffee, um, tea was too expensive, chocolate was, you know, right in that nice sweet spot where it was, you know, just elite enough, but not as expensive as tea. Um, the wealthiest people actually purchased special pots and accoutrements for the drinking of chocolate. What you'll see at the bottom is that the pots, uh, the bottom two images, they have these little sticks or uh, attached and that was to swizzle up the, uh, the hot chocolate. And the reason is because chocolate refined as it was in that day, sedimented, it will fall to the bottom and it has to be frothed up. Um, not until modern um, systems have really incorporated the, the chocolate fat and the chocolate liquor together to make a smooth bar. Um, uh, when that happened, the sedimentation, you know, obviously was less. Um, so here's an example of how important it was. When uh, Thomas Lee's original Stratford Hall burned in 1720, um, it was big news. The Maryland Gazette wrote about it, but also talk, talked about contents lost before the fire, um, stolen before the fire, and sort of had this list of those things that were most precious. One of the things they absolutely took note of being stolen was the chocolate pot. So here in the North American colonies, who were the masters of the craft of, uh, of you know, developing chocolate, both in terms of cooking with it and in terms of um, processing it as a, a commodity? Um, certainly at Stratford Hall, Caesar, the cook Caesar, he was known as a chocolatier. He had one of, he used one of three matates, three chocolate grinding stones that existed in the colony at the time in the earlier part of the 18th century. Uh, this would have been uh, an enormous skill. Chocolate is very difficult to work with. Um, as soon as it was ground, it would have been, um, had to be used immediately. And I want to make a point here that at Stratford Hall, um, they, they were wealthy enough to buy beans. The wealthy prefer to buy beans and have uh, those who uh, they enslaved grind them for them uh, because it was fresher. It didn't take on the smell of that a chocolate cake that was already milled elsewhere could have taken, let's say, being shipped with uh, a cargo next to salted codfish, for example. 
um, or salted beef. You know, it didn't it didn't have that uh, lesser quality. Um, other people of note, Prince Updike and Abraham Casey, both in Rhode Island, they were enslaved chocolate millers. They were known for their ability to not only mill the cocoa beans, but mill them well and mill them quickly. Uh, both of these men were able to um, earn extra money based on sort of the speed in which that they could mill chocolate and bought their freedom and became landowners based on their ability to work with this commodity. In Philadelphia of this period, uh, we have um, city directories that indicate chocolate makers by name, as well as enslaved chocolate makers, not by name, indicating that they were millers, they were chocolatiers or chocolate makers as it were, um, working in the employ of somebody else. So as I said, uh, in the 18th century, these millers would mill chocolate, they'd mill, mill the cacao and they would put it in a mold. The mold or the cake would then be sold. Sometimes it had spices in it, sometimes it had sugar in it, sometimes it did not for the, the cook who received it to ultimately use at their will. But the beans, as I said before, were much more favored than the bar. And the reason, as I mentioned, was because you could control the quality, you could control what went into it in terms of taste, much more difficult to use. It required that it be roasted, it would be shelled, it would be nibbed, and then it would be grated. Underneath that metate or that grinding stone would be um, a brazier or a holder with hot coals to heat that stone to make sure that the chocolate melted. So how was chocolate prepared at the time? A number of ways, drinks like hot cocoa. Um, this hot cocoa could have had egg yolks in them, could have had folded egg whites, it could have had whipped cream. It's a very thick and rich drink. Uh, often it was called chocolate cream. Puddings, tarts, chocolate tart or chocolate cream pie. This is a 17th century recipe. It was used very often. We see it in the great houses um, in Virginia, Mount Vernon, Monticello, certainly Stratford Hall cakes, candies, and tisanes. Tisanes meaning um, herbal sort of drinks or steeped drinks. A very common and popular drink was to steep the cocoa shell, not the cocoa bean, and create a tea out of it. This was actually very popular with uh, George Washington. So in closing, I just wanna say that, um, you know, drinking chocolate and chocolate confections and purchasing chocolate and cocoa beans uh, was a very important way for the wealthy in this period of time to show their status, to show hospitality to visitors, especially this time of year, especially during the Christmas holidays when families and friends would visit each other. To give them a bowl of chocolate really said that you valued them because it was it was a relatively expensive commodity. And imagine if that commodity was was the freshest it could be, and you had a master chocolatier, for example, like Caesar at Stratford Hall, um, or the other enslaved cooks and the women in the kitchen working with this and preparing it for you. Um, but the enslaved who mastered the milling of chocolate, the cooking of chocolate, those who grew chocolate, who fermented it, who danced the cocoa beans in the Caribbean, they rarely, if ever, tasted um, the expensive drink and confections that, that came out of um, this process in the Atlantic trade. So, um, so that's, that's the, um, the end of my little short presentation. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, so thank you. And I, and I want to say that um, Kelly and I worked together um, to come up with a little idea for you, for you guys. And that is um, at the end of this, everybody who participated is going to get a recipe for what is called actually the Caribbean cocoa tea or hot chocolate, because um, that is probably the closest thing that you will taste to colonial era hot chocolate, because it is um, it has all the spices. It's actually, frankly, much smoother and nicer than it would have been at the time or that it really is now because it sediments, right? The original, but this doesn't because we're, we're um, suggesting some beautiful chocolate for you to, to use with it. Um, so that Kelly and I came up with that idea together and you'll be getting that uh, when you get at the end of the presentation. <laughs> Ramin, thank you so much uh, for your You're wonderful so presentation. Much. And I, I love, so the, the way that this all worked out, it was just sort of this collaboration of minds, you know, this idea of having Ramin like really sort of chauffeur in this video that we're about to show you, to show you how the chocolate got to a place like Stratford Hall, who whose kitchen is behind me um, with a beautiful tint and a filter on it. So the next part of this program is going to be the film of Cheney and Nicole making two different chocolate dishes, 
period chocolate dishes. And it's a wonderful now segue this into this next section. I'm going to play the video on Zoom, which you can totally watch. If it lags at all, go into the chat and I will enter it in one more time because I think it keeps getting uh, moved back. I'm going to go ahead and enter in the link to the YouTube link if for some reason. This does not work on your side. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. It's about 16 minutes long. So sit back and, and really enjoy and pay attention to the work and the words that these two phenomenal women are, are saying in this video because it is incredibly powerful. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Give me one moment. All right. Again, if this is lagging for you at all, go ahead and just click on that link that's in the chat. My name is Chaney McKnight, and today we're making chocolate pastels that I got from Hannah Glass's Complete Confectioner, which was published in 1760. But of course, I added my own little twist to it. We're going to put some dry cherries and chopped up almonds in it. We'll see how it turns out. The world of the enslaved woman is clouded in misinformation and distorted by stereotypes. She is not Aunt Jemima, Kizzy, or Mammy because these women do not exist. She is Fick, she is Armamenta, she is Sarah, she is Conchiva, she is Rachel. These are real women. The inner thoughts of enslaved women remain largely unknown because she could never truly give voice to them but the true events of their lives are not unknowable, and to say so would be yet another injustice on their person. We do not have a full view of the line of their lives, but we do have views of segments. Through bill of sales, lease contracts, interviews, narratives, and correspondence, we see that skilled enslaved cooks were highly sought after. Not only were female cooks sought after for their skills in the kitchen, but also for their ability to increase their enslavers' holdings through their wounds. Hannah Till was a pastry chef enslaved by Reverend John Mason, who leased her and her husband, Isaac Till, also a chef, to General George Washington while he was on campaign at Valley Forge. Mrs. Till acted as servant and cook to General George Washington on campaign. She and her husband gave birth to a son at Valley Forge while on that campaign. The enslavers of these women wore their accomplishments and talents as if they were done by their own hands, as if she were merely a glove. Mary Randolph, who so proudly presents her receipt book as her very own, most likely took the receipts from her enslaved or the enslaved from her family's holdings. To be an enslaved woman in the kitchen must have been like having the weight of the world on her shoulders. People in her community, including her very own children, were not receiving enough nutrients. She could choose to follow the strict mandates of her enslaver and keep food stores strictly regulated, or she could risk her privileged position and even her own back to help feed her people. Many chose the latter. The culinary traditions of this great country 
were built upon the shoulders of enslaved African women. Today, I represent the ancestors as they should have been represented. Now we've made a double boiler. We take a pot of boiling water and put a bowl over that and then milk, melt the chocolate in the bowl on top of the boiling water. You wanna make sure that you take the uh, pot of water to, off the direct heat. That's what I've done here. And you wanna keep stirring. And it's almost impossible to burn chocolate on a double boiler, almost, so be careful. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna only have it on one side. We're gonna pop this in half. And we're gonna pop these, run over and pop these in a the freezer for just a little bit. So I have put the grated baking chocolate on the top of a double boiler and you want to make sure that you gradually melt it i actually took the water off of the off of the direct heat because i did not want to burn this and then once it's nice and smooth at the right temperature you can then take it over to your wax sheet or your parchment paper, and you can make a little circle. Are you all ready for it? And so you then take your almonds, a little bit of almonds on it, a little bit of almonds on it, and then you take your chopped up dried cherries. I like to place them very strategically, press them in. but not too many because it's already super sweet. And yes, they are sticky. But this is super simple and something that maybe a apprentice in the kitchen would be doing. So now we're done. You wanna pop this into the freezer for a few minutes. Um, make sure you keep an eye on it because it can turn a really weird white color if you don't temp temper it properly and leave it in the freezer for too long. So bring that out of the freezer and you have a nice treat.
So my name is Nicole Moore, and I am back in the Stratford Hall kitchen that was built in 1738, and I'm gonna be making this 18th century chocolate cream for y'all. It is going to be beautiful and amazing and easy. That's the beauty of this. This is something that you can start to use as a family tradition if you're just like, I need to do a little something. It's a great way to start telling and sharing stories. It's a great way to pass down the things that are important to you. And when we're really thinking about kind of the history in chocolate, I think about those men and those women who were enslaved on those um, cacao plantations that had to bring this chocolate to us. This was a luxury item. And so when I think about the history of chocolate, it's not just a sweet treat, but it's also a reminder of the things that my people have been through and how we've overcome so much. And so this is one of the ways that I'm going to honor them today. So we're going to take some of this amazing 18th century chocolate. And you're just going to put this in a double boiler. So if you're doing, y'all see I've got the kettle here, but if you're doing this at home, what you're gonna wanna do is have a double boiler set up. And so I've got very hot water in here, this amazing American heritage chocolate that is already melting. This recipe is four ingredients. It's the chocolate. We're gonna add a little bit of refined sugar. So pop that in there, it's gonna be super sweet. And then water, this is how we're gonna start. So I'm just gonna pour this in here. And what I wanna do is I wanna start whisking this together because again, this is a double boiler setup. And I don't know if you can see it, but it has already started to melt. I might need to add a little bit more chocolate, but it's fine. And so when you're doing this, the stirring is really important. So remember, I said that there were four ingredients. So your three mains are already in here. And that's the sugar, the chocolate, chocolate is the most important, and the water. And you want to stir this over your double boiler until you've kind of gotten this creamy consistency going. Once you've gotten this and you've noticed that your sugar and your chocolate has dissolved, we're going to go ahead and take that off of our double boiler. So I'm going to move this over to the side. And I am going to get my eggs ready to be tempered in. You want to let this cool probably for about five to ten minutes because what you don't want to do is pour your eggs into the hot chocolate because then they'll tend to scramble and curdle and that will mess the texture of your cream up. So let's give this a second to rest and then once it's cooled off we'll continue with the eggs. All right so our chocolate has cooled down enough for me to go ahead and start pouring my yolks in. And these are, it's, I want to say, three egg yolks, but I'm going to start doing it a little bit at a time. Again, I allowed my chocolate to cool, and you can tell. You can see that the yolks are still remaining a liquid. So we're just going to keep pouring this in. So we were talking earlier about making those family traditions and having those things. When you pass this down as an oral history, make sure you put this part in. But this is important. It'll teach you also kind of the patience of it. And I think about, again, those earlier chocolatiers and how this became art to them. And so my egg yolks are kind of making little designs as they incorporate themselves in. And it kind of gives you this moment of solitude and this moment of just connecting the past with the present. You want to mix that in. You're starting to see the chocolate itself shape up. It's starting to thicken a little bit. That's what those yolks are doing. They are providing a thickening agent. Add the rest of that in there. Now these are clearly very raw eggs. And while this chocolate is warm, that heat alone is not gonna be enough to cook these eggs thoroughly. And so then you are going to place your chocolate back on the double boiler. So we're going to make sure that we put that back over here very carefully because this is still very hot. And what you'll want to do is keep this going on a low temperature. So if you're at home doing this on your stove with your loved ones, maybe this is a good time to have the younger ones do the stirring and take turns stirring and really getting this going. You want to do this, though, for about... 30 minutes. 
Don't stir it aggressively. You don't want it splashing everywhere. But just again, think about that artwork. Think about, you know, how long this would take doing this over a fire, making sure that you would have to not just temper your eggs, but also make sure that you don't burn your chocolate. So we're gonna do that for about 30 minutes. So after 30 minutes of continuous stirring, I've gone ahead and taken it off the heat. It is still a little bit warm, but that's perfectly fine. Look at, look at how beautiful that is. Because what I wanna do is this would be served in cups, little dessert glasses, and they would chill it. So what I wanna do is while it's still a little warm, we're gonna go ahead and pour it into our bowl here. Just pour that in. Get all of that in there. It looks so good, y'all. It smells amazing. It's almost like there's a cinnamoniness into the chocolate itself. That's that heritage chocolate. It's just, it's just different in the best possible way. And then I am going to chill this probably for about an hour. And then once it's chilled, you can serve this up. Start sharing your stories. Start creating those memories. Remember the art and the artisans behind this chocolate during this period of the 18th and 19th century and just enjoy it. And so you're gonna put that in the fridge for about an hour. You're gonna wanna let it set and cool down completely. It is already starting to set in this kitchen here. It's beautiful. So we wanna thank Stratford Hall for always inviting us into the space and to honor Caesar and his legacy in the place where he worked, this kitchen. It just has a feeling and every time we're in here, it just is good. We wanna thank Mars American Heritage Chocolate for always ensuring that we are able to do this work with the appropriate tools and to keep those lessons and that history alive. And most importantly, we wanna thank you. Thank you for joining us and spending this time with us. We'll see you next time. ask my panelists to turn their cameras back on. Ladies, I'm just loving all of this. I think one of the things that's ringing so sort of deeply in me right now is all of you talking about honor, um, the ways in which you're honoring your ancestors, the ways in which you perform these cooking, you know, styles in their honor as well and their recipes etc it's just a beautiful way to sort of tell those stories i wanted to um, bring this rest of this conversation into the contemporary kitchen so you know the title of this program was sort of the atlantic world and these historical kitchens but then let's talk about the ways in which chocolate has made its way into restaurants like brown sugar kitchen um, we have chef tanya holland here owner of brown sugar kitchen and i would love to sort of end this first segment of the program by engaging with you a little bit and just talking to us about your restaurant and the story behind it. Because when I first learned about you and your restaurant and your passion, it really it resonated in a way um, historically that I think needs to be talked about. So welcome, Tanya. Hi, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just so interesting. Um, you know, you can always learn in this business, which is what I love about it. Um, and especially listening to Ramin's presentation, learning things that I didn't know at all and thinking about my own heritage of, um, you know, really, I was born in Connecticut, but we lived in Massachusetts and then my dad was from Virginia um, and I went to University of Virginia, as you know. So it's like I was like all around, all, you know, historically where these, these things were happening. Um, and I was telling the story yesterday about, you know, my parents, as I think Kelly, you know the story, I grew up to parents who loved to entertain over food. They had a gourmet cooking club that lasted 20 years from the time I was seven to I was 27. They cooked food from around the world. Um, so I got exposed to a lot of 
regional American cuisine, you know, they cook the food of their home, uh, Louisiana and Virginia. Um, and definitely sweets, you know, and chocolate was a big part of it. Um, the desserts, um, my paternal grandmother was really um, fond of making desserts and saying them at Christmas time. But I also remembered, we used to drive to Toronto when we moved to Rochester to a restaurant called the Underground Railroad. Um, mm. and it was a soul food restaurant. So that was, you know, I grew up in white suburbia, but my parents really like the food was what connected us to our culture the most, because that's the thing you can take with you no matter where you go. And as you know, cause you're involved for my next cookbook, uh, California Soul, we are following the migration of African-Americans from the South to California. And a lot of what was brought is food. And we're talking about their contrib contribution to the California foodways, which is very significant. Um, so, I mean, you can't look at food and cooking in my mind without looking at history. And, um, you know, this is just so amazing, you know, again, what enslaved people contributed. And now I know that I can um, legitimately um, own my chocoholicalism. <laughs> <laughs> is that if I saying it right? But I love chocolate so much. And when I went to cooking school in France and I lived in Paris for a while, like, I think I got like a little tablet of chocolate like every day. I can't remember if it was once a week or once a day, but there were so many fabulous chocolatiers and I really feel that I do have a discerning palate for chocolate. And, you know, I kind of like to buy different bars um, every now and then so I can, you know, test them out and see what I like um, and look at the different percentages and where the chocolates source from because there's a lot of bean to bar now and a lot of, you know, artisanal chocolate bars. Um, and it's really fun for me. And we have, um, you know, I learned a hot chocolate recipe, you know, along the way. And we have a hot chocolate um, that we make in house. And I, you know, my servers are like, oh, the cocoa. I was like, no, it's not cocoa. It's hot chocolate. And it is like, <laughs> it's really, you know, it's homemade, but it's made with chocolate and cocoa powder. I use Valrono cocoa powder and uh, Guitard, which is a local uh, five generation family owned chocolate maker here in San Francisco. That's just an excellent product. So, um, and we serve a chocolate bread pudding. So I feel like, you know, this is all happening for a reason. <laughs> it's made its way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Tanya. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to open it up for questions. Anybody before we open it up for Q&A? Um, I also just wanted to have you guys add a little bit before we get into this discussion with the, the visitors here on Zoom. But how do you all, like, how do you honor, I mean, we just saw how you honor your ancestors with this, but what drives you to do the work that you do? And how is chocolate and food part of that, that legacy that you're carrying on? I mean, I like food. I like to eat. <laughs> My grandfather, he was a chef at the Citadel for decades. So he's cooked for kings, presidents. And growing up, when we got the chance to see him cook, he, he also loved to feed people. My mom picked that up. And then watching her cook, um, it's it's something like it's it's instilled in our, almost in our genetics. And part of me is like, one day I'm gonna do a whole DNA search I'm going to find out if there was an enslaved cook in my family because it, it just feels like it's natural. And so being able to show people your love and your appreciation for them through food, knowing that it was men and women who looked like me that were cooking for people who considered them property, but they were still finding ways in the cabins to make these meals for themselves, to put their love into you know, people that had been working in the fields all day and were exhausted with these very minimal rations and just something about that, just that heart and soul in feeding and nurturing. Um, I think that is kind of what drives me. It's what I've seen in my family. And it's something that I want to pass to my kids. My oldest likes to bake. My youngest, who's three, she's really into me making macaroni and cheese. So if I can get her now, you know, then I think I can really start to just kind of carry that legacy of using food and using our history and, and using that as a way not to just educate, but to also show love and to share warmth and to just, you know, feed people because 
who doesn't want a good meal? That's the truth. That's I didn't know that about was it mm -hmm. your grandpa you said? That is so mm -hmm. cool. Cheney, you want to chime in real quick? <laughs> yeah, that is that is really cool, Nicole. Um, I think I honor my ancestors um, by living well. Um, the best um, thing that I can do day in and day out um, is to concentrate on health, laughing, uh, jumping for joy when I can, because um, my ticket to a life in the year 2021 was paid for in blood by my ancestors. Um, so that's the first thing that I can do um, and constantly say their names, speak their deeds, um, talk about them and educate as many people that will listen. And um, when I think about food and my connection to my ancestors, it's so, it's so in the forefront of my mind right now because I just came back from my family in Manning, South Carolina. Mm. And there was just a ridiculous amount of food, <laughs> just a ridiculous <laughs> amount of food uh, for a family gathering. Um, but um, it just reminded me that I come from a long line of cooks <laughs> and uh, people who have cooked for a living and people who cook to feed their families. Um, and we are people of the, we're people of the land, we're people of, of the earth. Um, and looking at the exact land in which we were enslaved on, um, it just brought everything full circle. Um, and it reminds me that uh, food brings us together. And it's one of those connections, those very tangible connections that we can connect ourselves with our immediate ancestors and ancestors uh, two and 300 years back. Um, we can trace uh, foods um, from the ground in Manning, South Carolina to uh, Ghana. And I think that that's just amazing. And then to California, right? It's like, it just keeps going. That was beautiful. Thank you, Chaney. Anybody else want to chime in? Well, you know, I'm just going to say, I'm going to echo what everyone says, said here. But um, what I do want to say is that, you know, for me, my, both my parents are immigrants. As I said, my father's from Trinidad and Tobago. And when I was growing up, even though I was from New York City, you didn't get to be you, right? You had to assimilate, you had to, to go along. And so the only time either of them, but especially my father would talk about our culture was when he was cooking, right? And the thing that he impressed upon me in these stories is that the only reason we are on this side of the world was especially if you're Caribbean, was to support sugar and cocoa. That's what you were there for, right? To cut less cane and cut less cocoa. That's what you were there for. And so he never let me forget that. And I think that's why I focus on food history, right? Because for, for my family, that is a very tangible reason, just like for everybody here, of why we exist here in this place and this time. Beautiful. Tanya, you definitely said your part before. Do you have anything else you want to add before I open up the Q&A? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, I'm just like, my wheels are spinning thinking like how many more people really need to, to hear all this, you know? It's just great. It's very inspiring. Everybody else's stories. Thank you. All right, we got some questions. Let's go ahead and kick these off. And um, I know some people as well, just for those of you that are watching, there are some hard stops for some of our panelists. So we're gonna hang on to your, um, here as long as we can. So Cynthia asks about the black market. So she says, hi, this might end up being answered, but given that chocolate and cocoa beans were such hot commodities, was there a black market trade of these items during the revolution or some secret trading of chocolate for arms? Other resources, thanks. 
sure one of our panelists, I'm thinking of Ramin, might be able to answer this. I see your head nodding pretty lively over there. Yeah, so the answer is that in fact, there was, a, there was as you would imagine, a great um, diminishment of co cocoa beans into the North American colonies during the British blockades of the Caribbean, right? Um, so those millers that I talked about, particularly in New England, um, and, and I just want to like, just quickly say as an aside, the reason why these cocoa millers were in New England is that cacao ironically does not lend itself to be milled and turned into bar form in hot countries. That is why you have only in the 20th century bean to bar production in the Caribbean and in Africa and so on. It had to come north where it was cooler naturally in order to be processed. Um, so those folks pretty much went out of business and there was smuggling. It wasn't enough to keep the industry really going, but there was a fair amount of privateering, um, not just of course for co cocoa, but other things as well, um, tea, coffee and other Caribbean trade items, but there absolutely, there absolutely was at the time. Thank you. Well, um, we've got a question from Jane. Are there any, uh, is there any record of Caesar writing or otherwise passing on his recipes? There are not, uh, but we do know that he was the chef there um, during the middle of the 18th century at Stratford Hall. And we're just really starting the research here. I started my position here at Stratford Hall about three and a half years ago. And we are literally just sort of skimming the top of the work that needs to be done here. We have tremendous archival resources and we're working with the descendant communities as well well across the country. And so I'm hoping that some stories will, will start to sort of rise up. So thank you for asking about Caesar. I appreciate that. We have a question from Celeste. How much influence did the Dutch have with the American colonial chocolate use? I'm in the New York Hudson uh, Valley. So that there's a regional interest for me. So I think Ramin or Cheney can probably tackle this one. You can give it to Cheney. I know she does work or either one of you. I yeah. think uh, your question. Remain <laughs> will have the will have the technical, uh, <laughs> and she'll be able to clean up what I say. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Dutch had a stronghold on the spice trade. I mean, they had a monopoly on it um, because they uh, they colonized the uh, spice islands. Um, so um, a big part of chocolate is the sugar and the spice. So pretty much every item needed for uh, chocolate to get a cup of chocolate, uh, the Dutch at one point had control over it. Uh, so from sugar uh, to cacao to uh, spices. So um, absolutely, um, when we look at Dutch New York, uh, you do see, um, you do see quite a bit of chocolate um, pop up. Other than the few uh, inventories I've seen, that's all I can say on that matter, <laughs> Ravine. <laughs> so the Dutch um, actually control the cocoa trade to Europe. Most of the European cocoa came through Amster Amsterdam. And so when the Dutch did hold most of New York, um, a good quantity flowed in through New York as well through the Dutch. Um, and then later on, um, the Dutch's role in the Caribbean trade automatically placed them in brokerages, um, both through the, you know, the islands they colonize and with other islands to move um, cacao up to North America. Awesome tag team answer there. That was fantastic. <laughs> we have another question here, and this is for Nicole. So what is the consistency of that chocolate with the egg yolks after it sets? Is it like a pudding, a syrup, something else? What you got, Nicole? I mean, it ended up, it gets, okay, so imagine a, a can of frosting. If you let it sit <laughs> too long, that's what it ends up being like. Um, so you want to, so you want to make sure that when you have it, it's that pudding consistency. We did have some and we let it sit and it was quite fun to just kind of like whack it a few times. So if you, if you get to that point, you've gone too far. You want that pudding kind of a smooth, a little bit thick, not super watery, but also not frosting. So if you hit that sweet spot, pun intended, in the middle, you're going to be good. It was oh, still delicious, it? just oh. FYI. It was good. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, is it like a pot of creme? You know, the French pot of creme? It's not 
it's like you know it's not really a pudding mm -hmm. but it's much more silky and softer than a, than a pudding but it's still yeah. firm right yeah like, mm -hmm. yeah exactly because that is essentially a pot of creme recipe like i'm sure kelly and tanya while you're watching you're like more or less that's a pot <laughs> of creme right like a like a what was it the dino the italian version of that we used to have to make I can't remember. I think it's called Badino anyways, but it's the same thing, but it, I mean, it takes forever and you're whipping it and whipping it. And then it's just this perfect moment and you can't mess with it. And then you just want to eat the whole entire bowl. because it's that <laughs> good. All right. Thanks ladies. Um, there's a question from Andrea and I think um, it says, where can we pur purchase? I think you met Tanya's cookbook. Um, you have several cookbooks, actually. So does Ramin. So you both want to do some plugs for your cookbooks, ladies. <laughs> Go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, sure. Um, well, my first cookbook, New School Cooking, is out of print. I believe you might be able to find a copy here or there on Amazon. Uh, Brown Sugar Kitchen cookbook came out in 2014, and that's still in print. And that reflects the uh, recipes from my restaurant, Brown Sugar Kitchen, where I'm sitting right now. I moved to this space two and a half years ago. And then next year, I have a book coming out called uh, Tanya Holland's California Soul Cookbook. And Dr. Dietz is a contributor and a big contributor. And we're really excited <laughs> to have these uh, historical um, pieces to support the, the text of the recipes and tell the story of, um, you know, the African-American foodways in California. And we're uh, also featuring some makers here and so look for that. I don't know when pre-sales are going to be available, but it's supposed to be available fall of November, uh, fall of 2022. So Thank exciting. You. Thank you, Tanya. Rami? Um, I, so I think the book that for the purpose of this discussion that would be most interesting to everybody is um, the book, actually my first cookbook was written about um, the, the food of Trinidad and Tobago. It's, it's called Sweet Hands. Uh, island cooking from Trinidad and Tobago. Sweet hands or sweet hand is an expression we use to say that someone's a really good cook. We will say, boy, she has some sweet hand, you know, right? Like sweet hands, <laughs> right? So that could turn anything sweet. So, uh, and there's a lot, there's a, a fair amount of, or a couple of, of cocoa recipes there. I want to say what's interesting, you know, when you're Caribbean and you grew up in a cocoa producing country, in an ironic sort of holdover from the, what we're talking about here, the period of enslavement, we don't actually eat a lot of chocolate. We actually don't eat a lot of our own chocolate, right? And the chocolate that we have is really the lesser quality. It's not really our beautiful chocolate that gets set out of the country. Um, but I think that book is the most interesting. And then, as you mentioned, my novel about um, Chef Hercules Posey, enslaved by George Washington, the second edition has recipes that I added that he would have likely cooked, including a chocolate tort recipe, a chocolate cream pie. Awesome, thank you for that, both of you. There's a question, I guess I can answer this one. Was chocolate more of a treat at the Lee dinners or was it ordinary fare? The Lees were incredibly wealthy and I have a feeling that they probably sipped chocolate every chance they could get. They were one of the wealthiest families in Virginia. Caesar was probably one of the best chefs in the colony, if not uh, the nation. And so I would say they probably had it pretty regularly after dinner and as well as when uh, guests came over. They did not spare anything. Uh, they were definitely fans of eating on high level. So thank you for that question. A great question here that I would love for you all to chime in on. What's a good African-American printed cookbook um, early or sort of passed on oral, orally that might have a chocolate recipe in it? So talk about some of the early African-American cookbooks that we, we know of that are printed. And they're not a ton, unfortunately. But... I'm trying to think if Melinda Russell has a chocolate recipe. I can't remember. Um... I don't know if anybody else remembers. No, that was Mrs. Fisher's cookbook. Yeah. Um, I would think that Edna Lewis might have, you know, in one of her books. Probably, right? A pie yeah. or something, right? Yeah. And then Rufus Estes. Mm -hmm. Rufus Estes is late enough, mm -hmm. later enough that he would have had, a, you know, a fair amount, I think. Um, so Rufus Estes, it's called Rufus Estes, Good Things to Eat. That's that, that one is like 1890s, early 1900s. Russell, and you can find, yeah, yeah, they're on crazy. Amazon and they're fairly inexpensive and it would be great to support those books. 
Awesome. Well, thank you for that answer. All right. Here's another question here. Um, what kind of a recommended reading would you say um, to look up on this topic, on the history of food or any of those things? Well, the Dr. Dietz's book, first of all, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, Bound to the Fire, right? Uh, yeah, but yeah, my book's called Bound to the Fire, How Enslaved Chefs Invented American Cuisine. And you can find that on Amazon pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so the interesting thing about this is that, um, you know, well, Jessica Harris does a lot of great work across her books. You know, everyone knows Jessica now from High on the Hog, which is, of course, the series named after her book, High on the Hog. But she's actually written many, many, many books. And this, this, this discussion weaves through all of them. So I would encourage you to look at her books. Um, uh, Psyche Tony as well. Martin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Psyche Maybe Williams Morrison is fantastic as yeah. well. Yeah. Definitely. And of course, I mean, everybody, I think at this point knows Michael Twitty. So he's, mm -hmm. he's out there ahead of the game with everyone, right. but there's, this is a growing field and it's, it's a really exciting time for those of us that have spent time in professional kitchens that have this passion for history to see this sort of collision of our worlds come together on the front stage you know, people actually want to know about all of this now. And I think for a lot of us, it's been a very lonely passion for a long time. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, everyone wants to know, you know, all about the stuff that we've all been thinking about or doing or, you know, sort of working on for so long. So it's, it's a really exciting time to be doing this work. So there's a question here about chocolate and savory dishes. I'll let any of you answer that. I know for a fact, um, and she said, for example, mole, I know for a fact that when you all were melting that chocolate, Dontavious Williams, uh, who's one of our regulars at Stratford, one of our, our resident um, historical chefs, he made a beautiful pork roast and we were literally dipping the pork into the chocolate in front of the hearth. I mean, we looked like a mess. We had chocolate everywhere, but it was one of the best things I've ever eaten. So, it was so good. It was right? so good. And yeah. I don't know what it is, but chocolate and pork, especially if you have a dark kind of a bitter mm -hmm. chocolate, it'll change your life. It, we it was sound crazy, else. but it will change your life. <laughs> Anybody else want to add some savory chocolates? Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I have know, come I remember across a sorry. A chicken. I've come across a chocolate chicken uh dish um and it's dutch in origin and i have not made it yet i'm i'm intrigued it uh dates back to the early 18th century who knows i will try it out and let you all know how it goes and i'll drag nicole and dontavius down that road with me the, you know, the thing about chocolate, about cacao, is that it is extremely bitter when it does not have sugar in it. So we're accustomed to thinking of it as a sweet thing. But in fact, in its native form, it is not sweet at all. And I remember when I was in culinary school, um, I had a chef instructor who had um, been cooking with pure unsweetened ch chocolate powder actually as a replacement for um, not to gross anyone out, blood as a thickening and flavoring agent in, in, in various stews. So this is a very old classic French technique. It's not really done anymore, where animal blood was used as a thickening agent and a flavoring agent. And it is unsweetened chocolate that most mimics that because like blood, it's highly mineralized. Um, so I personally, when I make chili, I used unsweetened cocoa powder in chili. Um, to like create this a bolder sort of more uh, richer flavor. Anything else? No, I want that pork really bad. <laughs> All right, we have a question here from Robin asking about um, any other specialized tools or dishes that were dedicated to chocolate processing and consumption and have any of these things been found archeologically at Stratford? We do have a beautiful set of, are they, I think they're 18th, late 18th century, early 19th century sipping cups for chocolate um, and they're porcelain and they're stunning. So there's definitely a sort of material culture response to this consumption of everything 
everything from, you know, from tea to even the influence of sugar, making tea and coffee more palatable um, and chocolate as well. But I can't think of anything besides that and the, you know, what Ramin showed, the different pots, you know. Um, can you think of anything else that was specially the used for? Swizzle, the right? Swizzle, the yeah. Pots sometimes had a swizzle, but you could also buy a swizzle, and I'm now forgetting the name in Spanish, but this is actually an ancient Mesoamerican tool. The matate? Not the, the tate is the stone. Is the it's thing, a, yeah. Uh, I'll think of it. But um, yeah, so this is a, you know, a, a, a traditional thing, but then they made it in, in other forms, right? So not ceramic, but metal or beautifully carved wood, um, and they made it a decorative item um, to go along with these beautiful chocolate pots. Oh, let me see here. All right. Um, there's a question for Cheney. Have you tried to add alcohol to your recipe? The look reminded me of New Orleans pralines pecan candy. <laughs> um, not to this uh, specific one, but I have made uh, drunken chocolates. Actually, the people, uh, my neighbors received um, drunken chocolates uh, last year. And so it was quite delicious. Um, I also uh, made a uh, Twinkie soaked in bourbon and then dipped that in chocolate. <laughs> yes, Uncle Nearest, uh, a whiskey as well. So um, I think that it definitely could be incorporated into the chocolates. It wouldn't be much of a leap. Uh, so go forth my boozy love it. tears <laughs> i love it this is a question i think here for nicole i'm pretty good with cooking estimations says carla but are there specific measurements needed for that chocolate cream so yeah let's get into that recipe there for a second miss nicole i mean yes but um <laughs> the original recipe i think we got out of hannah glass's cookbook but what you saw was literally it. Like the only thing that was really calculated was the three eggs. Other than that, it was chocolate, good sizable amount, sugar, not too much, and then water. And I think incorporating the water slowly so that you don't flood your chocolate and it becomes a watery mess is important. But Again, and I think that's why I said, I think like there was legit an enslaved cook in my family line because I don't even really follow recipes. I just do things by feel. Um, this is why I don't bake because that's a science and I am not a scientist, but cooking, like just doing that and just kind of cooking and playing with it, especially if you're gonna do it with your kids or with your family, it's just that kind of fun thing to do and to experiment with it and building those traditions that way. But if you were looking for a clear and concise recipe, I would say one part chocolate, half a part of sugar, two, three sprinkles of water, three eggs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here that I think I needed to address. Um, somebody asked if somebody got caught tasting chocolate, did they get punished severely? This is a question that comes up a lot in public history sites. And I think those of us that work at these historic sites are constantly sort of dealing with questions. I actually literally just read an article about this that came out on Monday, questions from the public asking about the severity of abuse or the sort of happy slave narrative that are sort of two you know, ends of the spectrum of these sorts of narratives. All of the abuse that happened on these plantations varied from site to site. Everything from the fear of having your family sold away to the threat of being beaten to dismemberment, it all happened somewhere at some time. And so I think it's important to temper all of this conversation with a very sobering sort of reality that you know, life for enslaved people was terrifying. Whether or not your enslaver was somebody who was notorious for abuse or not, the fear of that was a constant state for these men and women and children that lived on these plantations. So a lot of times, different plantations, the enslaved chef could actually eat some of the food that they were cooking and share that with their family. Other sites, it wasn't the same. And so I just, I wanted to address that um, in a very serious way before we move back into the more sort of food conversations to again, balance that narrative and be able to sort of think about these things in a more nuanced way. So thank you for asking that Vera. 
Here's a question I think that um, I think Ramin would probably want to answer. So how did the British blockade to North America affect the cocoa trade in the Caribbean? Was it redirected? Did it affect the work of the enslaved community? So how did sort of wars and those kinds of things affect the trade generally? I think it wasn't just cocoa, right? It affected everything like rum and sugar and all of it. Maybe I answered the question. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> So, right, so it did affect it did affect the trade, but but I I want to be clear about something is that it wasn't it it didn't affect it in the way you think. So these commodities were still being produced, and they always had a market in Europe, right? They had a market in North America, but they always had a market in Europe. In fact, cocoa was more expensive in Europe, right? So it could be re redirected that way. But the American Revolution and the blockade of the Caribbean actually had a, a much different effect, and it was this. The Caribbean depended on the North American colonies for food to feed the enslaved. Every square inch of land in the Caribbean was given over to sugar or cocoa, right? Because these were profit crops. They was not given over to growing food. So Connecticut, Tanya, you're from Connecticut. I live in Connecticut now. Um, you know, the, the wealth of Connecticut, the wealth of Rhode Island, the wealth of Massachusetts, grain and salted beef and eggs, uh, to, to go down to the Caribbean. So what happened during the American Revolution during those blockades, enslaved people starved to death because the food was not coming from North America, the British blockade. In Jamaica, 10,000 enslaved people alone died from starvation during the American Revolution. So it did, so it did affect it in, in multiple ways. I mean, if people are starving to death, they're clearly not harvesting your cocoa for you or your sugar, right? But those that still continued to work and the labor that still did continue, the, there was still a market in Europe. Thank you, Ramin, for that. Here's a great question. So since they did not have a freezer or cooling other than a spring house, especially in the South, there were some ice houses though. How would the chocolate get hardened up to serve? So I know the Lees definitely had access to ice. Um, any other additions to that that you wanna add? Besides um, maybe not making things that had to cool in the summertime, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I just real quick with uh, pastels, they do say um, room temperature, um, but I would just say um, definitely not in the heat of uh, Virginia summer would you be making uh, pastels. Um, so um, I have taken a few um, chocolate tempering classes too, to be exact. And I'm still really bad at it. <laughs> and so my usual goal is just to eat the chocolate really fast. But if you really want real advice from people who make chocolate, Ramin. <laughs> so funny. Well, the, so I just want to say one thing about this. And, and so Kelly's right. It's don't make things in super, super hot conditions, right? Um, yeah. That's, you know, obviously the more you, north you went in the south, you had a better chance. But I just do wanna make a point here um, that the chocolate that they were using really, really, really was not like the chocolate that we have today because it was in the 20th century that a process called conking was ha happened and also much better grinding technology. And also another technology that actually separated the cocoa butter from the chocolate liquor. So what we know as white chocolate is really just cocoa butter and sugar. Mm -hmm. Cocoa butter is in that bean right with the chocolate. It has to be forcibly separated. It requires modern technology to do that. Once it's separated, it's added back to the pure cocoa and that's where you get grades of chocolate. 60%, 80%, 90%. It relates to how much chocolate liquor is in that bar compared to the cocoa butter that's added back. The chocolate that we're talking about, it was never separated, right? It couldn't have been separated. So it was actually suspended more, um, it, it was bound more tightly to the cocoa liquor. So I suspect that it had a much higher melt point. And I say this on the basis of having brought home cocoa balls or cocoa sticks, like that first picture I showed you from Trinidad, where the beans are just ground, same way, same way that it would have been done, you know, by Caesar, for example, um, and then mixed into something else and put back together. 
um, they don't melt that easily, right? Oh, but they're also not delicate. You cannot use them for a delicate preparation. And I've, I've read a few um, receipt books of the period. And what always shocks me is that they do not spend a lot of time talking about the tempering process. And right. as you know, today, if you're making a homemade bar of chocolate, that's like <laughs> probably the most important part, unless you're going to eat it right away, like I do. Right. Um, <laughs> because you will, you'll put it into a box and give it to your friend. And when they open it, ew, it's this really <laughs> spotty chocolate. Um, so do you think, Ramin, that that had a hand in uh, the, because today it's such, such an important step. Do you think that had, um, when you look at the receipt books, there's not much mention, mention of tempering? Yeah, I, I think there, there isn't because um, the, the tempering or that delicacy really happened when there was that separation and then adding back right, of, you know, separating cocoa liquor from cocoa butter and then adding it back, right? So the percentage of fat in there is what is what requires the tempering, right? It's not really the cocoa mm -hmm. liquor that requires it, it's the fat. You don't want the fat mm -hmm. to go off or the fat to harden in a certain way. That's why I think there wasn't. I think, I really don't think that they were making, um, first of all, it was rarely smooth. It was rarely smooth. It was usually gritty. Like you had that even, you know, that beautiful, gorgeous cocoa cream. And at the bottom was all the sediment, right? So yeah, I think that's why. I think it just wasn't something, the technology didn't allow for that to be a thing in their world. So we have um, two of our wonderful panelists have a hard stop at 8.30. So I want to ask a question of Tanya that came in a minute ago. And Kristen asks you, can you talk about your process of developing new recipes? Hi. Um, Briefly, yeah, obviously. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Well, you know, I, I think a lot seasonally out here in California, especially uh, what's in season, um, or what's the occasion or, you know, what's on the menu is missing. And then, I mean, I have a ton of cookbooks, hundreds. And, um, you know, I also look at food magazines or I'll dine out and I'll take notes and think, oh, you know, there's a, you know, a something dish. How can I make this more soulful? How can I translate this into my genre? And, I mean, I've had so much experience cooking all different kinds of cuisines and all different kinds of techniques. I actually do a lot of baking, um, bake at the restaurant. So just kind of, it's a combination of all that, um, you know, that, and then you just have to experiment and keep tasting and make sure you have the right consistency, the right flavor, the right balance. Um, if I'm creating a, a full dish, like an entree, um, I have to think about presentation. There's just, there's a lot that goes into it. it and sometimes it can take a village. I mean, I do have recipe developers that I work with, or recipe testers that if I give them an outline, this is the recipe that I wanna create. They're actually people who work very precisely on measurements and um, you know, test it again and again and again, because once it goes to the cookbook, it, uh, it really, it has to work because it has to work for um, a novice cook. I cannot wait to come home to the Bay Area and go to your restaurant. So I, I want to, I know, I'm just so ready to meet you in person too. Um, so I want to go ahead and use this opportunity. It's about to be 8.30. We are going to stay on for a little bit longer with Nicole and Ramin, but I want to say thank you sincerely to Cheney McKnight and Tanya Holland for sharing your passion, your knowledge, your time with us tonight, your stories. And I just, I am delighted to have had you on here tonight to be part of this. So thank you so much on behalf of Stratford, on behalf of Marge Wrigley for being on this program tonight. And I cannot wait to see you both soon in person. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, ladies. Good night. Thank you. All right, Nicole and Ramin, <laughs> we have got a few more questions. We got to answer. So are you ready for this? Let's go. All right. Glad that I the question thing huge okay this is a really interesting thing so this is from deborah she says i have a recipe for chocolate cake called squirrels chocolate cake squires see i read squirrels because i'm at stratford and that's like our site's 
animal or something. Anyways, Squire's chocolate cake. Now I'm thinking about dipping squirrel into chocolate. Okay, focus. <laughs> it has two batters. One is with eggs, sugar, milk, and flour. The second is eggs, sugar, milk, and chocolate that is boiled. What could you tell me about this recipe? I've never heard of a cake with a boiled batter. And she said that she's also um, from New England. Ancestors go back 400 years. So any idea of this boiled batter thing? Have you heard of it? If not, then we're all puzzled. And that's totally fine. No, but it, you know, it reminds me of, um, God, my mind is shot, but there's a Japanese method of making bread where essentially you, what is the name of that? Where you, um, you know, create a paste, uh, right. a, a boiled pa a paste, right? And then you, um, part of the batter, and then you add it to the kneaded flour. So, but that's super interesting. That's something I'm going to try to um, see if I can find a reference to. I've never, I'm not, I don't even remember seeing a reference to that in, in a in an older cookbook. Um, so thanks for that. If we find out, we'll let you super know. Super interesting. Yeah. Anything you got, Nicole? You seem to be. <laughs> Nope. No, I'm just like, again, baking. Not what I do. Yeah, I do. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. <laughs> but um, I'm Celeste, very curious. <laughs> Celeste asks for Ramin, can we get your chili chocolate recipe? Sure. Sure. Awesome. Absolutely. And again, we'll all be receiving that other recipe um, that Ramin so kindly typed up for everyone. All right. Um, we have a question here. It's actually a really beautifully phrased question. It's a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. Listening, it's from Nateria. <clears throat> she says, I'm listening and learning about this topic makes me question how I can do more to make sure my children and their children and so on don't miss out on understanding cooking traditions and their origins. Making a family recipe binder is on my to-do list. What else do you recommend to keep traditions alive in our homes and communities? Beautiful question. Mm -hmm. Ladies? First of all, hey girl, hey. <laughs> I had the pleasure to meet Natira a few weeks ago. She's amazing and doing some great work. Um, I think though you're on the right track, that family binder of recipes. If there's something that everybody loves, you're like, all right, y'all love this and you keep asking for it, write it down and put it in a place where um, you know that like y'all look for this binder. Um, it's the conversations. I think that's what, how we really keep pushing our traditions and just the oral, it really is the oral histories, telling the stories, um, gathering everybody around and, and making sure that they know what goes into a dish. They may not be able to make it, but just saying, man, my mama used to make this dish and it had, and it had this, this, and this in it. And, and just passing that down, because I think that's where many of us get our recipes from, get our traditions from. You know that there's that one person that can make the macaroni and cheese for the holidays. Like that's, and that is because, you know, somebody instilled in them. And so you wanna, you wanna make sure that when you're doing this, you're like, all right, what's my signature dish? What is it when I'm gone? I want you to remember me. And I want you to say, my mama used to make this. I think that that's really it. and. Black community is notorious for making sure that you don't eat that person's food, but you eat this person's food. <laughs> and it's from that community of oral histories. Like if the chitlins are gray, don't eat them. They're not clean. <laughs> you eat this Mildred's chitlins, but Mama Joe, you might be able to eat her. It's, it's just kind of, I think for us, it's a lot of the oral history. It's a lot of that because our ancestors weren't allowed to read and write. They might've been able to, but they weren't allowed to. And so we've really gotten to the tradition of storytelling, cracking jokes over food, just keeping those things going and the conversations going. That's how you're gonna share the history, but that's also how the younger generations are gonna absorb that history. Yeah, I, 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 I can't, really add much more to that because I agree with it 100%. I'm uh, Natura myself in the process of now writing down recipes for my daughter. Um, and the reason is because, um, you know, I was relatively young when both my parents died um, seven years apart. My mother, my father's from Trinidad, as I said, my mother was from Iran. And uh, I really, it's, you know, your mother's food really means a lot to you. And she didn't teach me how to cook. She never got around to it. So I had to spend a lot of time teaching myself. And there were no Persian cookbooks in those days. And I had to figure it out and beg recipes from people and find the one book I could find and keep redoing it. Um, and it impressed upon me how important it was to not let that happen. And so um, the, the person I really take a lesson from 
who did this inadvertently was my father. As I said, he would talk, he would tell stories when he cooked. Um, so I would say to you, not only cook with your children, but tell those stories, tell those stories. And don't wait for it to be like a big thing, like we're gonna make this big holiday recipe or this special occasion dish. Just whatever you're doing every day on a little little basis, talk about it, you know? And, and that's the other thing I'd say that, you know, this tradition is, is kept up in, in bits and pieces, not in grand gestures. You know, why do you add this particular spice when, you know, every single day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I just taught my daughter the other day, why you add, why Persians add sugar to saffron when they grind it, right? Um, such a simple, silly thing. And I was literally, literally like, come a minute, let me show you this and go on your way, right? So think about it in that way too. Like, how can you do it every single day? And little steps. I love that. I absolutely love that. We have a couple more questions here and then we're going to wrap it up for the evening. Um, so let me see. Let's go ahead and do the more answerable quick question first. Adrian asks about coconut recipes. Um, do you see any in the 18th century? Um, do you have any examples of them? And of course, you know, they were being traded on those same ships as everything else. So anybody want to reference a coconut recipe real fast? Trying to think of an actual one, but but yes, there was a lot of coconut trading and coconut recipes do appear in Amelia Simmons, Hannah Glass, um, um, Randolph's cookbook, Mary Randolph's cookbook. So um, maybe I'll think of one, but there are, there are certainly uh, coconut recipes. Cole, you got anything? I was going to say Hannah Glass because I remember okay. flipping through it. <laughs> And I was there you go. Play, but I learned something about the coconut trade just now. So yes. Right on. All right. This is a perfect final question. So I'm excited about this. I think the three of us can have our own two cents. Um, Isabel says that I understand that this doesn't get asked, but throwing it out there anyways. As historians and researchers, are there questions about chocolate making and consumption in the U.S. that you hope to see answered in the future? I'll go ahead and let you two do it and then I'll answer last and wrap it up for the evening. But um, who wants to go first? What kind of questions do you want answered in the future about chocolate? Well, from, from my perspective and the way that I do work, I really would like to see um, more verified detail on um, African-American chocolatiers enslaved and free. Mm -hmm. um per, and, and and the whole process the chocolate millers the chocolate roasters um you know sailors who worked on ships that that mm -hmm. moved chocolate from the caribbean i would like to see these um, individuals give their names be out there i mean i mentioned um abraham casey um for example um but there are so many more and i would really like to see more of that detail like un uncovered we know who the Frank, who, who the white chocolatiers and millers are, we know who they are and their names are. I'd like to see um, it become true for the African-American community as well. I think the same. And I also, I'm working with a site that's doing a lot with um, kind of their history of chocolate. I wanna know more information about the illicit trade. Clearly there was a demand and we know that it was done with a lot of enslaved labor. But for me, it's always gonna be why. Like, why couldn't you just get this through legal means? And why did you have to traffic humans while doing that? And mm -hmm. so I think um, really kind of answering those hard questions and then how do we, and then tying that into how we associate with chocolate. We look at modern day slavery with chocolate, but we don't talk about the historical narrative enough. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to just ask why. And also how is this a crop that's still sustained? because of how much was used. So mm -hmm. future stories and books can be written about, you know, the dirty of it, but also, I mean, we're hooked on it. <laughs> we're addicted to chocolate. I wanna know how we got here. 
I think that those two answers pretty much summed up what I was going to say. Um, I definitely want all of those things answered. And I just, I have to give another shout out to Mars. The work that we're doing at Stratford is allowing us to do the research on the enslaved chef Caesar, to do the kinds of things we did tonight, to have you all here talking, bringing honor and context and history to light um, for these ancestors. And I am so grateful that Mars is at a, at a place where they are supporting places like Stratford Hall and allowing us to do this kind of research and tell these stories. You know, like you said, I want to know their names. And there is something so powerful about saying the names of the people who have been written out of history because, you know, they've never had their time to shine. And it is through their labor and through their talents and skills that we know about things like these chocolate tarts, that we, you know, we eat the, the dishes that they created and no, don't realize where they came from. So the connectivity that we're, we're part of right now, this, this group on this Zoom call and all those that we work with is really bringing those threads from the past bringing those stories forward to be able to have a better and more honest community in which we live. So this work is heavy, it is important, and it is an honor to work with both you, Nicole, and Ramin, and our other two panelists who got off. Um, it has been a wonderful night tonight talking about the sweet and the sorrow of chocolate, and it's a wonderful just opportunity to be able to bring these stories forth, and I really love sort of seeing all of these strong, intelligent, dedicated women speak together. And I wanna plug a couple of things before we hop off. One is that we'll be doing another program. That's the second part of this program about chocolate, but it is um, with uh, three male chefs that we're having um, come do some, some work here at Stratford where we have Dontavious Williams, Michael Lindsay, as well as um, Top Chef contestant, Chris Scott. They will be participating in our next chocolate program, which will be in February. So go to our website and find out. Also, I wanna show a slide really fast and give plugs to two upcoming programs. Give me one second here. That is not what I was looking for. That was looking for links to send people in the chat uh, right here. Okay, that was hilarious. All right. so. Um, join us for upcoming programs at Stratford Hall Science Saturday. Um, this Saturday is December 11th at 11 a.m. It's a fun program for kids, as well as Christmas Tide, December 11th from 5 to 8 p.m. on site. That is a very important program. John Tavius Williams will be cooking in our 1738 kitchen, talking about the history of Christmas um, for the enslaved community and the food that was cooked and also part of the sort of angst that's around that moment for enslaved individuals. The very powerful program. We had a virtual version of that last year with Nicole Cheney and Dontavious. If you want to see that, you can find it on our YouTube channel. So on that note, I wanna thank everyone for zooming in and being part of this. It's, it's an honor again to be here with you all and I cannot wait to work with you again. So good night everyone and thanks ladies so much. Thanks night, Kelly. Thank you for night, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Deuces. <laughs> I'm trying to get off. I can't find the. I'm really happy that. There you go. I couldn't get the thing to end. Okay, I'm ending. <laughs>